saw Katie out there too, raising hands. So, oh, let me just. Inaugural address by John F. Kennedy. So Kennedy is elected president in 1960, on January 20th, 1961. He provides his first speech. Um, one quick note, and this is this is minor, but sometimes it's it's kind of annoying. Um, do you see, Sarah, when you copy and paste quotations, how it's like gray? So just here's an easy way to do it. Tap anywhere in here, do Control A, and that will select all of your text. And then you just pull it down to text black. And that'll make everything black. And that way you don't have to worry about just, you know, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's, I, I'm going to start by talking about the introduction paragraph with Sarah's. And like I said, it should be about three sentences. I saw one in first period with four sentences, but still following my formula, it's still perfect. So let's look at hers. In his speech inaugural address, John F. Kennedy wanted everyone to know how serious he was about being president, not that he was a rich guy trying only to help the rich and not the poor. Interesting. That's a perspective that we haven't entertained about that speech yet, but I like it. So what does that first sentence tell us? Something very important that we've emphasized over and over again in speech analysis. What has Sarah identified in her first sentence? The purpose. Thank you, Kaylee. He also wanted to make it clear to the Soviet chairman that he did not want war, but genuine peace. This also helped him to make friends with the third world. So Sarah has given me, oh, and now we've got another one. Kennedy wanted to gain people's trust and ensure them that they had made the right decision. Sarah has given me many sentences outlining his purpose. Excellent. The introduction paragraph should give sentences identifying purpose, and she starts it correctly, too in his speech, inaugural address, John F. Kennedy. She's missing one part. I'll talk to her about that and all of you. But I want to look at my model example. Look at mine. In his speech at the Brandenburg Gate, President Reagan wants his audience to feel unified in their opposition to the Soviet Union. He wishes for every listener to feel that the allied nations in the West are free and devoted to peace, whereas the Soviets and their allies are tyrannical and devoted to war. Reagan does this through intentional shifts in voice and repetition of key words. Like Sarah, I start with in, his, in this, and I give the title of the speech. Like Sarah, I follow that up with the name of my speaker. And finally, like Sarah, I give a couple sentences explaining what the purpose is, what he wants to do. What did I do, what did I add to the intro that Sarah did not? Katie. Two devices. I end the intro paragraph with the two rhetorical devices that I will speak about. Reagan does this through intentional shifts in voice and repetition of key words. Something as simple as Kennedy does this through, or Henry does this through, or Chisholm does this through, or Jobs does this through, or Douglas does this through is easy enough. here and do you have alliteration? Alliteration? Um, one quick note, Sarah. Which is in your first developing paragraph? Alliteration or field here? That should be the first in your sentence also. Good. Now her intro paragraph's working really well. Give me the name of the speech. Give me the speaker. Give me the purpose. Explain the purpose in a couple sentences. Then Identify the two rhetorical devices that you'll focus on for the next two paragraphs. I'm going to look at the rest of Sarah's, but Katie's also volunteering. Why do I always do that? Never works out for me. Hillary Rodham Clinton, Women's Rights Are Human Rights. I'm just going to look at the intro. 
In her speech, Women's Rights for Human Rights, Clinton wants her audience to feel concerned for the mistreatment of women in the world. Perfect. Throw that uh, comma inside the quotation marks, please. She hopes that the listeners will support and help prevent this. She wants listeners to agree that women should be allowed equal rights, treated with more respect, and seen as actual citizens. Clinton does this through repetition of keywords and phrases, but she also states appeals to pity. Um, perfect. Just to keep this concise, but she also appeals to the audience's pity. Nice. Who's next for an intro paragraph revision? speech, equal rights for women. Shirley Chisholm wants her audience to feel the importance of sexism and why it needs to conclude. She wants every listener to feel the importance of how females are being treated unfairly and unequally. Chisholm states that she wrote this speech not because she is black, but because she is a woman, A-N. She declares the importance of sexism through intentional shifts in violence and appeals to pity. One quick note about language. Everything's in the right place, Kayleen. You're, you're doing an excellent job. If she says the importance of sexism, it sounds like she values it. She doesn't value sexism, right? She wants to end sexism. So I'm guessing uh, wants her audience to feel the importance of sexism, wants to feel the, what negative word do I want? Horror is too much, tragedy is too much. Crime? Offense? Damage. Um, damage, danger, danger. Yeah, danger, that's simple enough. Uh, feel the importance the danger of sexism and why it needs to um, conclude the strange word choice, why it needs to stop. She declares the, how about a synonym for danger would be threat. So how about she declares the threat of sexism through intentional shifts in voice and, and appeal to pity. Good. to the Virginia Convention. In his speech at the Virginia Convention, Patrick Henry wants his audience to appeal to their sense of anger and their opposition to the rule under Great Britain. It's a wordy way of saying that he wants them angry at Great Britain, but actually, specifically, he wants them to fight, right? So his end goal is not anger, his end goal is fighting. Anger is only the vehicle to the fighting. So I might focus, yeah, war. I always bring war fighting into that first sentence. In order to do this, Henry uses metaphors and rhetorical questions. Good. It's just a slight change. Make sure that war and fighting is prioritized. Since he does see it as essential. Okay, last one for the intro. Steve Jobs, stay hungry, stay foolish. Sarah, perhaps Wendy was having problems because the network was slow today. Huh. Almost there. In his speech, they have his job uses repetition and analogy to convince the students that failure isn't the end and that they must be open enough to use the knowledge and experience that they have gained to be successful. The analogies he makes shows how he turned his failures into successes. His use of repetition shows the students that they should be less worried about what others think 
uh, what others may think when they are striving for success. So Gabe, your intro is almost all about your devices, which means that you need to emphasize more about the purpose, talk more about that, and less about the devices. You will write an entire paragraph about analogies. You'll write an entire paragraph about repetition. There's no need to include this much, much information in your intro. If you look at my example, I only mentioned mine very briefly. Why? Because I, I will expand on them quite a bit. So in your introduction, I would... Oh, and do you notice what happened with your first paragraph? You don't have a topic sentence? You start with your example, right? It's what? But it looks like... Uh, it looks like this is your topic sentence. So what I'm saying is don't delete those two sentences in the intro. Cut them out to your developing paragraphs. And then expand on the purpose. Make sense? Cool. 